So, the H class, and oh, happy days. This is the point at which I really do have fun with people, because the H class are often held up as these high, high level designs, these wonderful ships which the Germans are going to produce, which are going to be world beating. They weren't. So if you're looking for a video which is going to sit there and tell you how amazing the H-Class would have been and how they would have been wonder weapons which have won the war for Germany, go away now. Just don't, don't waste your time watching my video. Don't waste... Don't, you know, put in a comment going, no, 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 they would have been amazing. They wouldn't have been. And there is a very simple reason why they wouldn't have been amazing. It's the same reason why Bismarck class and Tur Bismarck and Turbots weren't amazing, and it's why Scharnhorst and Eisenhower weren't as amazing as they could have been. Because they start off with a very good idea, they start off with a very simple idea, and then all the different bureaucracies and sections in the German government involved in the procurement go to work on it. And they all have to add in their own bit of the pie. Until you end up with a frigging mess. An overcomplicated, inefficient mess. And yes, it has stats. It looks... It has potential on paper of being great. But no, because it's got the most complicated engineering you can possibly imagine. So how can you support it at long range in there? And in the case of the H-Class, the frigging infrastructure will not support building it at the rate they need to for it to be actually viable. Because here is the really crucial thing. They lay down two. After they have launched Bismarck and Tirpitz and are you know, now doing the, the final finishing up on the construction of them. So they lay down two. They've barely got them started before World War II begins. In the nicest way, Lion and Temeraire, the first two King George, uh, King George V successor Lion class vessels, the 16-inch gunships of the Royal Navy, are already started. If World War II holds off long enough for these to actually be the two of these to be completed, the odds are the Royal Navy has five lions in the service, plus probably a couple of vanguards, if not three, and the five King George V's, and the upgraded Queen Elizabeth class. Possibly some R class still knocking around. Upgraded Renown. Probably upgraded Hood. There is just no scenario where those ships come out and everyone's going, Wow, you are the most powerful ships in the world. Oh, and Nelson and Rodney as well. How can I forget them? They were the colour screen. So, it doesn't work. And then you've got the fact that the H class design keeps evolving. So it's a movable feast of what is this going to be. It's a constantly movable feast. There are options. And there are some good works that do go into the details of it. Uh, Singfried Breyer is a good example. I've been doing a lot of work with him lately. Uh, there are a fair number of other ones. Most of the big books I've got close to me though are my British and American battleship ones because I've been doing things on them. And the H-Class has featured as a constant what-if because it's part of Plan Z. It's part of the whole idea of building up the German Navy. But here is the point, okay? Germany is suffering from infrastructure max out prior to World War I. They literally cannot build ships fast enough to deliver on even their modest, modest plans put out in their naval laws, let alone actually to compete and produce a viable risk fleet, as I was discussing in the risk fleet video of Alfred of Alfred von Turpers and Risk Fleet on I think it's Tuesday the 8th of August 2023 dominating from second that's the title of the video they were still they were suffering that much infrastructure wise 
that's before World War One, before the losses of World War One, before the Treaty of Versailles, before all the twenty odd years of inactivity of not doing enough to maintain a viable infrastructure even with the projects they stuck in the Netherlands and all over the place that was not enough to keep a viable maritime infrastructure industry going James book plug going on here and that's a good example of Britain keeping a maritime industry going and building up a maritime industry program the entire destroyer program of the 1930s is about building up and growing Britain's maritime infrastructure after having a decade of not building enough, uh, building much due to treaties and the war glut. So there is a lot of stuff they need to do. They don't have the physical yards in terms of the number of those yards. Those yards do not have the space they had prior to World War One, They don't have the depth of personnel they have in terms of experience they built up. You've lost two, three generations of naval architects and their institutional memory. You've lost that many number of naval, that gener number of generations of constructors, whole generations of naval officers building up experience. And you're also complicating it with an organization or structure which, let's be honest, places a premium on political acumen and political loyalty over actual capability. Which is a fundamental problem with most of the German wonder weapons. That as good as their marketing and the political spin on them. The people working on them are more often than not chosen for their ability to put their ideas and make their case to the right people in the political structure than their actual ability to do the job. And you can point out to other countries around the world, even democracies, who go, well, they just have, they have the similar problems. Yes. But in a one-party state, that tends to get very skewed. It tends to get incredibly skewed. In a one-party dictatorship, then that skewing takes on a life of its own. In a democracy, for all its points of failure and interesting quirks, there is usually some balance. There is usually some ability and some requirements to actually deliver on what you promise. So what were the Germans thinking about? Well, to be honest, you could argue the initial ideas of H-39 were to take the lessons of the Scharnhorst class, the lessons of the Bismarcks, and turn them into a 16-inch battleship. That's not a bad idea. It's going to have eight 16 inch guns. It's not bad. That's a perfectly viable idea to start off with. It really is. But, and I say this in the nicest possible way, like many other things, it starts evolving. And this is why we, when we're talking about the H-Class, we have to talk about the H-39, we have to talk about the H-41, 42 through to 44. We have to talk about all the options. Because the H-Class are both a response to the world around them, and perhaps more importantly, their response to the obsession of any dictator, it seems, with building things bigger and better. There is a scene in the in the movie. Um, I forget the name of the actor. The guy who was behind Borat. 
who did a movie called Dictator. And honestly, the movie was, for me, utterly forgettable. It was funny, but it was utterly forgettable. Apart from one point. And it's turned into a bit of a meme over the years, and I see it everywhere now, of the Dictator turning around to his chief scientist and going, but the end has to be pointier. But it doesn't matter. It, it has no effect on the aerodynamic performance of the missile. But no, it has to be pointier, because it won't be scary. He's prepared to add extra weight, possibly make more issues with the system than need to be, in order to make it look scarier. I, he's prepared to have a less overall effective product or system because of its perceived effectiveness because of its image. And this tells you a lot about the H class. You know, the, the fact is, they go from the 39, which has 16 inch guns, to the 41, which has 16 and a half in, is going to have 16 and a half inch guns, which is a good gun to, to go with. Let's be honest. I'm not going to complain about a, a 420 millimeter uh, gun. That 16 and a half inch is what I strongly suspect was the actual armament of going to be for the G3s. Uh, because it fits more with the Royal Navy's development of designs. Jumping to a 16 inch from a 15 inch doesn't make sense when you've done everything else in one and a half inch increments. And the fact is, 16 and a half inch would be the lowest they were aiming for at that point. And they were working on 16 and a half inch guns, we know that. So for the G3s, that would make sense. And the 16 and a half inch is often. 420mm is what I consider roughly to be about the actual sweet spot. 16 inch is getting very close, but in terms of impact, when it hits, the size of the ordnance, ordnance carried, and the weight of the shell, and the rate you can fire it at, 16 and a half inch is very good. But the thing is, no 16 and a half inch guns appear, but 16 inch guns do. So you've also got the possibility, quite possible possibility, that the German Navy could have ended up with the Scharnhorsts, which were 11 inch but could be upgraded to 15 inch, the Bismarcks, which were 15 inch, the H-39s, which H-39, H-40 could well have been 16 inch, because they actually produce the 16 inch guns and they get used at things like places like Band Battery Lindemann here. Potentially, 16.5 inch for H41, or potentially, they got 18.9 inch, or maybe even 20 inch. Which, if you're talking about having two battleships per size of calibre of gun, you are basically turning your entire navy into... This is where I'm going to get in trouble. A cottage industry. Because there is no efficiencies if you're sta not standardising your guns. Yes, you can go right now. Oh, no, no. What they'll do is they'll standardise the Sharnos and the Bismarck onto 15 inch. Okay, so that's four 15 inch gun battleships. And then you have the H39 uh, forty. They'll have 16 inch. Yes. And then you'll have whatever comes afterwards, either 18.9 inch or 20 inch. And let's say you build four, uh, or maybe two 18.9 inch and two 20 inch. So you're between 10 battleships, you're going to have four different calibers, four different shell types, and shell systems need to be developed. Four different stockpiles need to be maintained. Four different maintenance sets of maintenance procedures. Four different sets of service records. Four different production lines. I know I have problems with the Royal Navy in terms of having the 14 inch of the King George V's, but they build five of them. And Vanguard is another 15 inch ship. 
And yes, they've got Nelson and Romney, which are 60 inch. But basically, that uh, and the other advantage for the Royal Navy is the sheer scale of the British maritime infrastructure. You're not having to build whole new factories. You can build a 60 inch gun ship. You can supply it. It would have been more sensible if the King George V had been 16 inch ships or 15 inch ships. It would have been far more sensible. But then you've got the Americans who are 14 inch and 16 inch. They're a very good example of sensible procurement going on there. A very good example. But the thing is, not only did the ammunition keep changing and the guns keep changing, but the size of the vessels keep changing. And as they grow bigger, the infrastructure needs to support them to grow bigger as well. A yard which is going to build a 277.8 meter long vessel is probably not going to be the same yard you can build a 345 meter long vessel. Or if it is, you're going to need to do some work to lengthen out its slipway and its facilities. A yard which you are building is something which is going to have 37 meters of beam. It's going to need work to accommodate something of 51.5 meters of beam, let alone your dry docks. And when your draft is expanding from 10 meters to 12.7 meters, that's a big jump. People go, oh, it's only 12.7 meters. That's a lot of depth of water. Have a think about how many. And again, think about this. It's 41 foot 8 inches deep in terms of draft. When you're dealing with something which is going to theoretically be 131,000 tons if built, imagine how much clearance you want between it and the water, uh, between it and the bottom. You're probably talking about going, well, I prefer to be in at least 50 foot of water. 45 foot is about the minimum I'm risking in this. Because, again, those drafts are always the average draft. And if you're taking on a little bit at one end, or you've got a little bit of a leak, which happens in ships, or you've got some sort of stability issue caused by, I don't know, one of the many, many systems in your ship which have been added in by people going we have to get our pet project onto the battleship and no one being able to say no for for risk of upsetting and fear upsetting their political patron just think about what that ship turns out as and just think about the problems you're going to have too often we put down the construction of uh, systems and we just think about the literal technical capability of it. Oh, it would look amazing and hand wave out all the other problems that come with it. Well, you can't. Reality is not that nice. History in reality is not that nice. There have been many, many times people have come with wonderful ideas. Both military and civilian ideas that have very soon fallen afoul of infrastructure very soon fallen afoul of the fact that the real world doesn't work like a nice neat piece of paper and that is ultimately the problem with the H plus because again their big issue is that <sighs> Oh, they, the, the, the Germans can't at any point say no to anything. If you consider their secondary armament, do they have a dual purpose armament? Do they, could the Germans produce a very good dual purpose weapon? More than likely, they have the technical capacity, they have the scientific ab ability, they have the engineering knowledge and know-how, they can see what everyone else is doing. What are they going to do? Well, no, they're going to produce a system which is going to have 12 5.9 inch guns on it. That's 150 millimeters because the important thing is you need the best secondary anti-surface weapon you can have for dealing with destroyers and light cruisers, which is the six inch gun, let's be honest. They're both right. And they want to have 16 
one uh, 10.5 centimeters or 4.1 inch guns. Now, why do they want that many of those? Because they're the best heavy AA weapon they can produce. They sit there and go, yeah, that's lovely. And you're carrying a whole load of 37 millimeters and a whole load of 20 millimeters. Lovely. But here's the thing. If you went with a five inch gun, you could possibly carry as many, if you're in the same space, with, compared to the six twin, you know, six inch guns and the six twin, well, the eight twin four inch guns, you could possibly, quite possibly actually, be carrying as many as 12 twin five inch guns. Yes, they wouldn't be as good at the end of ship roll as the six inch gun. Yes, they wouldn't be necessarily as high a rate of fire as the four inch guns for any air roll. But the sheer volume of them that could do both rolls would give you an advantage. And that is exactly what the British the Amer and the Americans did. Because they also had the technological skill. And the British and the Americans could go for the split armament. The British had done the split arm armament with battleships in World War I. But it takes up a lot of space. It's inefficient. Do you want to go? Sorry. The fluffy research assistant is feeling his next appointment. Now, of course, I'm the person who's always saying you have to judge a ship by the nation that's built its priorities. And really, you shouldn't say one is better than the other. Because it works out as an aggregate. So, why am I ranting so much and bragging so much on this, so this you know, split secondary armament? Because, to me, it illustrates another problem with the German system. Their inability to learn from what others are doing well. They're sure their solutions are the best, and sometimes they do have some very efficient, interesting solutions. But they categorically do not, especially in the run up to World War II, pay attention to what others are doing. You know, there is the classic is the Graf Zeppelin, which I've already talked about in a Another episode of Key Ships. Where they copy the burn. They copy that sort of ideology and methodology of operation in terms of carrier design. Rather than looking to the Japanese. Or the British. Or the Americans. And again, there are many who will provide me with technical reasons for why the, uh, why the Graf Zeppelin is a very good design. And honestly, any one of those ideas could have been an interesting variation to add in to make a ship more suitable. But when you're putting all of them together, the cumulative impact, that's going to make a lot of issues for your ship. Especially when you're already starting from relatively zero. And that's the thing to really think about with the H-Class when we're looking at the designs, when we're looking at these drawings. We are looking at a class, we're looking at ships, a fleet, which has been set to relatively zero by World War One by the Treaty of Versailles. They've had pre-Dreadnought battleships. They then got to build the Deutschland class for their whatever they're worth heavy cruisers with 11 inch guns call them Panzerschief if you want that's basically the German translation of ironclad kinda fits but Then they built the Scharnhorst, which were battleships, fast battleships. 
But again, they had the 11 inch guns. Why did they have 11 inch guns? Because that was the biggest gun they had ready. They didn't think about trying to buy guns from elsewhere. The options would have probably been the Italians uh, go for their 15 inches they fit in the Latorios. They are another fascist power, and let's be honest, Mussolini would love the ego boost of being able to say he'd given the Germans some 15 inch guns. What would you have probably got out of it? Six 15 inch guns? They would have been renowned, but with more honor. It would have been an interesting capability. And they were fast battleships. Please note, they're not battle cruisers. The amount of people who tell me, oh, because they're 11 inch guns, they're battle cruisers. No. Is it the largest gun the nation can build at the time? Yes, then it's not a battle cruiser. Battle cruisers have the same guns as battleships, but just because you have an 11 inch gun doesn't make you a battle cruiser. It's the largest gun your, the country could have at the time. They're fast battleships. But they start off with the Scharnhorst. Well, the Deutschlands, then the Scharnhorst, and then the Bismarcks. And each one grows bigger and more complicated. Each one has its design meddled around with more. And I've already discussed this to an extent, but this is a Groner. Uh, German warships, 1815 to 1945. Um, I put it into a table. I actually found the reference on the Wikipedia page because I was looking for a table of all their results. So I looked up the book and turned it in for myself. And when you put this together, and the advantage of this is it's all put together by the same author, so it there is a level of standardization going on here in sort of their development and understanding. It gives you a really interesting look into what is happening in terms of German thought process. These ships are growing exponentially, their guns are growing exponentially, but more importantly, all this stuff, all these ideas are coming up and it's, look at this wonderful, fantastic idea I have. Can we actually build it? No. So, what's the point? What is the point? If you cannot build it, what is the point in designing it? Now, you can argue the Tillmans and all sorts of things, etc. But the point is, the Tillman class could probably have actually been built by the Americans. They had a couple of yards which it would have been a squeeze but could have managed it. HMS Incomparable, I'll be getting to her in a couple of days, I think when this video comes out, could probably have been built. There are the yard spaces which could have done it in the UK. There are no yards in Germany in 1941-42 that could build a 131,000 ton battleship. They haven't got them. They have been the ones with yards which could have developed into that if they'd been allowed to develop over the previous 20 years were destroyed as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. They ceased to exist the yards they're left with are shells of themselves. And yes, they've been developing them, but let's be honest, the Navy in terms of funding comes in the 1930s a distant fifth to the Army, the Luftwaffe, the Gestapo, and in the nicest way, the vanity collection that is some of the projects they stick up around Germany. And you could argue even sick behind infrastructure. 
in terms of developing the autobahns, etc. But the autobahns are really part of also developing infrastructure for their army and the rapid movement of mechanized and motorized forces around, which is why it's so fun when you realize that they also have the um, large proportion of their forces not being mechanized or motorized of any army which fight uh, fighting anyone in 1939. It's also more embarrassing for the Allies at that point that they do get beaten quite so much when they're fighting an enemy which is not as mechanized or motorized as they are. In fact, the British Army, of course, famously in 1939, is the only fully mechanized, motorized army in the world. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Please note, the soldiers and everyone does a good job, it's just... Yeah, they're complete. They're strategically outfoxed, and thanks to French government and uh, a, a fear of their own army, and insisting they don't have decent radios, etc., because they might use them to rebel against them. Ah, it's fun times. But I don't want to get into the full details of that because it's far more complicated than the one that the one-line sentence will allow. So we'll leave that to one side. By 1942, you have this design. It's a good-looking ship. Honestly, if you look at the lines, I can see why people look at them and go, oh, they'd have been amazing. And the lines do look good. It, there's a bit, part of me, worrying about some of the spacing in this area and how that's going to affect the water flow. But, honestly, that's me niggling. And there's also me looking at the bow and going, you're trying to stick in a storm of Atlantic bow at this point, but you're also worried about dealing with some of the issues you're going to have in the Baltic, so you are trying to figure out how to make a compromise and how to design it right for the compromise. Again, I respect that. What interests me most is that this design is a four shaft design. And this design is a three shaft design. Now, one of the interesting things when you're looking at ship design, etc., is the decision of the shaft, over the shaft spreading. And this is where I get into trouble again on this channel, because I often comment about Nelson Romney that if you want to make them 28 knots, you could have done, all you need to do is add in a third shaft. And you could quite quickly have the space and tonnage, especially within the 1500 tons you have access to the 35,000 ton limit, to give yourself the boilers and geared steam turbine and shaft you need to get to have deployed that power enough over those and over the shafts to get to 28 knots but the point is if you really want to go fast and you really want to be capable of sustaining that speed for a long amount of time without pushing putting more pressure on the engines Four shafts is the way to go. You want to be able to spread the power, spread the load across different shafts. Because there's a limit to how much power, how much shaft horsepower especially, you can put through an individual shaft without warping it, for want of a better phrase. They are very strong, but they're as strong as the metallurgical science that you have available to you, and the fabrication process you have installed and infrastructure to support allow you to create. They're not infinite. They're not able to take everything. So yes, that's an improvement. But It's the start of an improvement, but it's also the start of further complication. Because once you start reading into the engines and the systems they're talking about putting into them, 
you realize very quickly that they're taking the already very complicated boilers of the Bismarck and Tirpitz, and they are somehow managing to add even more complication to them. They are... Well, they're making control of their boilers more art than science, really. Because control of a boiler is always a bit art as well as science. It's a bit trust your gut, judgment, experience, more than just these are the facts and figures, this is what's going on, A goes to B, da 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 da. It's, there's always a bit of you in there, a bit of art of the chief engineer. The more complicated you make things, the more individual you make things, the more you return to the era of HMS Warrior, 1860s, when it was more art than science. When they weren't really quite sure of the engineering and every single engine, every single set of boilers was completely unique. And that's what this design starts to look like and sound like. They start off with, well, 12 diesel engines supply being working through three special special gearboxes so four diesel engines per gearbox and a gearbox for each shaft then they start looking at integrating high pressure steam with to on se separate shafts and having a di diesel engines with those gearboxes for shafts, and then they have the idea of having high pressure steam, high pressure steam turbines feeding into the same gearbox that's also going to have the diesel engines to drive it. So you've got all the joys of dealing with the extremely intricate and very, very fussy German high pressure boilers. And when I say fussy, all high-pressure boilers are fussy, but the German ones are really are designed to be run perfectly. And when they are run perfect, they are absolutely amazing. But the trouble is, the tolerance for when that perfect is, is a very narrow sphere. So you are basically going to drive your chief engineer insane with stress. Well, they're coupling that with a very very complicated gearbox on top of a geared turbine steam turbine that's also connected to diesel engines to drive a shaft the point is there are option, other options for dealing with this Honestly, if it had been me, I'd have probably gone, let's ignore the shaft and go for an electric combination. But no, the reason you'd go for the gear and the direct drive option through the gearing is it gives you more power. It gives you um, more direct transfer, more efficient transfer of power to the water to allow you to get a higher speed and a higher torque on the shaft. Whereas perhaps a more sensible option would be to go for some electric drive and have all the steam turbines and all the de uh, diesel engines just supplying electricity. But that's not as perfect a solution. It's a lot easier <laughs> to implement and maintain. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean you have to worry about the diesels. If anything happens that goes wrong with the diesels and they cause issues with the gearing, that could then reverse in and muck up your steam turbine. Because let's be honest, if you get anything wrong in that process, you could break the gearbox. You could even break the the one of a better phrase of shafts, which run from the gear, uh, the turbines and the de eng these engines to the gearbox. There are levels of complexity going on here. And remember, 
This is a warship. It's designed to go into a scenario where people are going to be actively trying to destroy it. Jackie Fisher might have claimed speed is life and safety, but the reality is you cannot outrun shells. They will go fast than you. And if you're a battleship, that means you're going to probably be going into a, a scenario where you're going to be fighting someone who's capable of firing at long range. In which case, you're going to be firing at them, which is going to cause its own issues in your ship, because it always does. The shock and trauma of firing the guns is second only in their potential damage to the shock and trauma of being hit by the shells. I usually limit myself to talking about H-39 to H-42. H-42 is 90,000 tons. H-42 was going to have 18.9 inch guns. They are complete out of vaporware. I mean, the 16 inch guns get built. Uh, the 16 and a half inch guns, I don't think, ever leave the paper. There are some rumours about them, but honestly... The documentation stuff I've seen so far leads me to think they were schematics at best. They didn't actually have the plant to build them. And what plant availability they did have was busy doing things which were far more important. As for the 18.9 inch, but what really strikes home the more and more I look at these ships, the more and more A, I am of the belief that the Germans could have only succeeded with Plan Z if they'd either gutted the army or definitely not invest as much as they, as they did, or somehow managed to get a massive influx of gold to pay for the next five years without invading anyone else. And they would have to, I'm not sure how, stop Adolf Hitler gambling and invading other people. Because that's the trouble with Adolf Hitler. He is... And quite a lot of these uh, demagogic leaders of dictatorships, they gamble. They start to believe their own hype and they gamble on it. It's almost... Some weird desire to see how far they can push how far they can fly, how quickly. But Germany needed a lot of peace and, t uh, peace and money if they were going to build the infrastructure necessary to build even H-42. H-39 is quite possible. The 16-inch gunship... I have no doubt that that vessel if it comes into service does not weigh and displace anywhere near 56,000 tons <laughs> I'm sorry if that thing doesn't didn't come into service at least four and a half thousand tons overweight I would be severely surprised um, my bet would be about 62,000 tons but yeah it would come into service and it would immediately be in a world by the time it came into service, which would be probably 1943-44, where the Royal Navy have the King George V's and their successor, and possibly uh, King George V's, the Lions, Van Gaal's I said, and possibly the Lions' successors, already either well under construction or actually potentially in the water. The French will have the Reculus and whatever's come off them. The Italians might well have decided to start building another class of battleships after the Torios. I'd be really interested to see what the Italians go to after the Torios. And a world where Yamato 
would be, and Mushashi would be in the water. Maybe Shinana. It's a world where it comes in and it's going to be the big Germ new big German ship. And it's going to be scary because of its capabilities. But it's not going to be scary because of the reality of its, vi of it, its options. It's going to be scary looking at people going, oh, look at the capabilities of that individual ship. And then people are going to go, yeah, but we have five that can fight it. They've got two. They have eight 16-inch guns. Ours have nine. It can do 28 knots, 30 knots. Ours can do 30 knots. It's got a 300 millimeter main belt. Ours has a 14.7 inch main belt. It sounds scary right up until you're sort of there going, it's not, is it? And that's before anyone starts going, oh, and also there's the Iowas in the world. And there's this class and that. The point is, it's probably the best the uh, German infrastructure could actually build. And it's not, I'm not saying it's a bad ship. It'd be very useful to have. You wouldn't say no to having it. But it's not a wonder weapon. As I started this, I will finish this. It is not a wonder weapon. It's got capabilities, yes. But it is not a wonder weapon. None of these ships are wonder weapons. Because a fleet is never about the individual ships. It is about the composition of the ships. The aggregate. How they're made into task forces, commanded and used. What they achieve. Again, if I use another example I've discussed on this channel, ad infinitum, but I will always use it. The Battle of Taranto. HMS Ark Royal is the strike carrier of the Royal Navy. Everyone knows that. Contemporarily, I, I, there are people today who have issues with it, but contemporaneously, they all know that. that that's the Royal Navy strike carrier. Courageous and Glorious were also strike carriers, but they've lost them. Uh, so that means Ark Royal's the Royal Navy's real sole remaining strike carrier, which is why so many people focus in on it and its movements, especially after Courageous and Glorious have been sunk. Rather bad handling by the Royal Navy on both parts. Please note, uh, it's yeah, we'll get it. That's a complete. That's another video. And so they put a lot of effort into tracking where Ark Royal is and where her what she's doing. And the British make sure she's spotted attacking somewhere else. Which lulls Taranto into full sense of security. So that the fleet carrier, HMS Illustrious, suppose that she was, as planned would have been with HMS Eagle as well, another fleet carrier, but an older fleet carrier. But Illustrious alone, because Eagle had been damaged and they hadn't had enough time to do the preventative repairs they should have done because they needed the two carriers for operation again, because Courageous and Glorious have been lost so they don't have a third carrier to call upon Illustrious launches the strike at Toronto and no, that does not wipe out the Italian Navy it doesn't but it gives the Royal Navy very necessary breathing room in the Battle of the Mediterranean it allows them to consolidate and manoeuvre their fleet and gives them, it gives them three to four months of ascendancy which they need when they are stabilising themselves, especially in the world that they are currently dealing with, where they are fighting Germany, fighting Italy, and it looks like they're also having to deter Japan. I.e., the nightmare scenario is coming real. And a nightmare scenario for the Royal Navy, and if you look at this, the various plans the Royal Navy has, the Royal Navy has plans for fighting an Axis war in Europe, 
i.e. Germany and Italy, they have plans of fighting a Far Eastern war. Their basic plan for fighting all three at the same time, they don't really have a plan, their just concept is we do what needs to be done when it needs to be done and we try and build as many ships as frigating possible. Because they just haven't, especially on the treaty system, but also even government focus on spending. Even stuff which they were allowed to build, they didn't get to build the numbers they needed to build it. Sloops are a good example of this. Cruisers prior to the 1930 London Treaty when they could build as many as they liked. They didn't get enough. Well, they're going to do the best they can with what they've got until they can get more. And that's their plan for that nightmare scenario. This is H-44. H-44 is the... Well, it's the 8 to 20 inch gun ship. It's the Behemoth. The 131,000 ton vessel. And honestly, it looks like someone has just scaled up each of the designs. In a way, you can say it's the German incomparable, but... Well, let's consider it. The incomparable was... To be 46... 47,000 tons in standard displacement. Probably about... 54,000... 53, 54,000 tons... Fully loaded if we're being honest. 131,000 tons. Now sometimes people write on the videos when I'm talking about tonnage, this ship was clearly not possible because it's too light to be built at that under that displacement. No. It fits with the weight of things at the time. As time goes on, turrets get heavier. They have thicker armor, but also the machinery inside them gets heavier. It gets stronger. Why? Because the shells get heavier. And as the shells get heavier, so does the machinery that has to hoist the shells in a position get heavier. And therefore also, usually the barrel of the guns get heavier or longer, or they stay the same weight, but they still require more machinery to maneuver them. Especially when you want them to do a higher angle. That's going to be heavier, stronger machinery. Everything is going to add weight. As you add complexity, you add weight. There is that phrase which goes around sports car designers. Simplify, add lightness. With warships, add complexity, you add weight. You want those weapons to do more? That's going to be more tons. You want those systems to do more? That's going to be more tonnage. So when you turn around and you go, well, you know, how can they be designing a ship which is going to have 20 inch guns and yet it's almost a, th uh, almost a third of the weight, perhaps, displacement of this design? Is it because it's fantasy? No. It's because it's designed with the best technology of the time. And it's designed with the capabilities of the time. But those guns won't reach the same angles. Those shells won't be as heavy. So the hoists won't be as heavy duty. The guns, the gun control mechanisms won't be as massive. The gun control systems won't be as complicated. They won't have as many radars and other systems to support. There is going to be a lot of differences between the design of this vessel and the design of Incomparable. There are a lot of differences between the design of Yamato and number 13 class. And I'll be getting into that later in this series. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I always end these videos with a question. And usually the question from people that they put forward, especially in Patreon, 
is what happens if the Germans focus in on the Scharnhorst hull and carriers everything they build just the Scharnhorst hull. They just keep them with 11-inch guns instead of got 15-inch guns and they just keep churning out the Scharnhorst style hull and machinery. And I find that interesting. But I would like to clarify, go back. I think a more interesting potential, especially considering one of the options for the H-39 and the probable option for the H-39 uses 12 diesel engines. As what do you think happens to the world, and what do you think happens in the world in terms of construction, if the H-39 replaces Scharnhorst and Neisner, if the Germans produce a 12 diesel engine, free shaft, 8 16 inch gun warship instead of Scharnhorst and Neisner. If in 1935 they lay down H-39, what do you think happens? They make that giant jump. I have my own ideas over what I think happens. There are certain things which I don't ha think happen. I, for example, think that the King George V class battleship, for whatever, uh, no, no matter what the theory and the desires in terms of the 14 inch guns, I have a feeling if something with 16 inch guns is laid down by the Germans in 1935, I have a feeling that in 1937 the Royal Navy is not laying down a 14 inch gun battleship. I'll give you that one for free. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think it could have an interesting impact on the French. It could, but I don't think in 1935 they're in any shape or form. This is the other trouble when people ask, why do the Allies not do something earlier? Well, because the treaties have meant that they are navally completely disarmed. And honestly, if you look at the French army, they don't have the radios or the systems needed to do any offensive actions. So, ain't no one doing anything to Germany in 19, from 1935 or any time before 1939 because they're just not prepared for it. And honestly, they're not prepared in 1939 because they haven't been spending. Over and above the treaty system in Britain, you've had the 10-year rule. I War is not going to come back for 10 years, so no one needs to spend anything. Uh, no, You spend as if war is not going to be... You've got 10 years to prepare for war. Officially ceases to exist in... 1932 unofficially carries on till about 1937. There's a reason the Royal Navy that lays down their battleships in 1937. That's when the money's actually released. They ordered them in 1936. They've been asking for them since 1935. So, I don't think it would lead to instantaneous war in the woods. But what do you think would happen if, instead of the Shanos, they lay down good old H-39 here, with six, uh, aiming for 16-inch guns? And the nicest way that ship is going to take ages to develop. I mean, I don't see them entering service, even if they're laid down in 1935. I do not see them entering service before for late 1939, early 1940. Complications of the 16-inch gun, complications of the fact that the Scharnhorst themselves, they are laid down in 1935, launched in 1936, and Char uh, whilst Neisenau is commissioned in May 1938, Scharnhorst isn't commissioned until January 1939. And the Germans have the habit of commissioning before they've completed all testing and rebuilding. They commission first, go for it, put it for all the testing later. So, they've reached the level they're happy to commission, but it's not necessarily viable for operations at that point. I don't know. I'd be interested, I'm going to be interested in seeing what you all say. Thank you very much for watching. 
And please do remember that there are going to be com response videos to all, to well, to at least 60 of the key ships, which tells you I've got at least six series planned, and frankly there's more than that for, uh, stretched, uh, stretched out, um, over the Christmas period. So... This would definitely be in them. After all, it's only Series 4. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed.